Mr. Collier. While we were here, all right, my sergeant served a search warrant on your property. Okay? We have Kayla. Excuse me? We have Kayla in your property. She was locked in a container. Okay? She has told us that you shot and killed Charlie. Okay, so at this time, I'm going to need you to stand up and put your hands behind he's, your back. He's already here. Okay. okay. You're under arrest right now for kidnapping. What's up, Ewoo crew? It's the Raven, here to share another shocking, interesting, or just strange, but very true story with you. This is Todd Kolhep. Between 2003 and 2016, he murdered at least seven people in South Carolina, and his story is one of the most bizarre I've ever heard. What you're seeing is Todd's taped confession, and less than a minute in, he says this. I'm just thinking it's kind of funny. What? At the beginning of all this? Right. You helped us when you get back with my mom. Right. And I'm helping you solve a problem that just cleans the books up. You see, Todd agreed to tell the truth about his crimes in exchange for a few things. First, he wanted to talk to his mother and give her a photograph. And second, he wanted to transfer money to the college fund of a friend's child. There's probably not a lot we're going to be able to do for you. I don't know. Giving you a, a clear conscience is one of those. It's not transformative, and I don't give a Honestly, I'm not worried about my conscience. You gave me what I wanted. What I wanted was to be have the opportunity to take care of my mom, whether my girlfriend accepts it or not, to at least attempt to take care of her and her kid. Do you, you still that? want me to reach out and talk? I have not yet, but do you still want me to reach out and talk to her to see if she wants to come see you or talk to you? If she would, please. Okay, I will. The biggest thing is, please let her know that whether I screwed up, mm -hmm. I can't fix it. Mm -hmm. You'll notice he seems pretty friendly and gregarious on the outside, and the more I learned about this case, the more I realized that's kind of his whole persona. You see, if there was one word that I could use to describe Todd, it's cocky. He likes getting his way and receiving praise for his actions. In fact, many people theorize that the only victim who managed to escape Todd with her life realized this very personality trait and used it to stay alive until help could arrive. Her name is Kayla Brown. On August 31st, 2016, 30-year-old Kayla and her 32-year-old boyfriend Charles David Carver went missing. They just decided to move in together after a few months of dating. And in order to start building their new life together, the pair was looking to pick up some extra work on the side. Kayla goes, Oh, I know the perfect job. There's this guy, a real estate broker who I met through one of my exes a few years back. I'm sure he'll have something for me. And he did. Todd was a very successful man in the area after all, and he put Kayla to work cleaning houses for his listings. She was stoked to have the additional income, and the deal only got sweeter when Todd said he had a job that both she and Charles could take on together. This time, it was clearing brush at his own 95-acre property, which was only about eight miles away from his actual residence. When Kayla and Charles arrived, Todd simply instructed them to wait outside while he went into a garage on the grounds to get something. As they stood alone in the creeping silence, neither one had any idea that these few quiet moments out in the middle of nowhere were the last they'd ever spend together. Over the next few days, the couple's loved ones started to grow concerned. Kayla's friend knew something was off when all her calls and texts went unanswered. But even when she visited Kayla's home and left notes on her car, there was no response. Charles was very close with his mother and they talked every day. So when she stopped hearing from him after August 31st, she quickly reported him missing. Soon enough, the couple's apartment was checked and although they were nowhere to be seen, their poor dog was inside all alone without any food or water. This just wasn't like Kayla or Charles. Something was seriously wrong. But even when the two were reported missing, there was virtually no trace of where they could have vanished. And then something really weird happened. Charles posted on Facebook. That's right. All of a sudden, just like nothing had even happened, Charles was back on social media with posts informing his friends that he and Kayla were expecting a child, that they had bought a house together, and that they were now married. He apparently also shared out-of-character posts about digging holes, sword violence for some bizarre reason, what? and chillingly the final lyrics to the Eagles song Hotel California, which finishes, you can check out any time you like, but you can never leave. He shared strange posts like, I wonder if I said hello, how many people would say it back? Let's try it. Hello. What color ribbon supports the cure for people who can't keep their nose out of other people's business? And, sometimes late at night I dig a hole in the backyard to keep my nosy neighbors guessing. 
These all seem to be aimed towards deliberately provoking Charles's friends, and on this last post, people commented, Is that what you did to Kayla and the real Charlie? And, Are you hinting at what you did with them? To make things even weirder, Charles's account was sharing and liking the missing persons pages set up by the couple's families, even promoting a fundraiser that hoped to hire a private investigator to look into the disappearances. None of this sat right with, well, anyone. The grammatically incorrect and mean-spirited post didn't sound like Charles at all. Not to mention the real Charles was barely ever active on Facebook before all these sudden posts. The account at one point even posted an old picture of the couple captioned, We're fine, which was soon deleted. On October 1st, a concerned friend commented, Where the hell is Kayla Brown? To which Charles's account responded, Kayla is with her husband, Charlie. Why can't she have any contact with us? And who is this? She doesn't want to. I don't believe that. I know Kayla. She's not going to just run away from everyone. You or her should at least let someone know she's alive. The people that need to know that we are okay know that. If you look at the timestamps on these comments, they're only minutes apart. Whoever was replying wasn't even taking the time to carefully think out these cryptic responses. One friend shared that they were sent a disturbing message from the account reading, I'm just missing to everyone else. We are both okay. There's only one person that knows where we are. The no, I does not most to me and Kayla. She knows where we are, and we are coming that way forever. Well, as you can probably guess, this wasn't Charles using his account at all. It was Todd trying to throw people off his trail, buy himself some time, or maybe, just maybe, he was doing this purely for the fun of it. Like a little performance he got to put on. And the further we dive into his life, the more you'll see that Todd definitely cares a lot about having all the attention on him. But now, let's go back to what really happened that last day of August when Charles and Kayla showed up on the property. After going inside, Todd had suddenly re-emerged from the door, but the friendly facade that he was known for in town had completely drained. Now, he was dead serious, and as Kayla and Charles looked down, their hearts sank at the realization that he was holding a gun. Before they even had time to process what was happening, scream for help, or run, Kayla says that three bullets were fired right into Charles' chest. Kayla's whole world screeched to a halt and she could do nothing but watch. She knew in this moment she was trapped, all alone on the expanse of property of an unpredictable killer, one who absolutely nobody in town would ever suspect to be hiding such a horrible secret. She was utterly silent and still from shock as Todd grabbed her, placed her in handcuffs, and then led her inside of a dark metal shipping container. This would become her prison. She was chained by the neck, ankles, and hands and would Jesus. spend all day inside the box, except for 1 to 3 p.m. and 5 to 7 p.m. At those times each day, like clockwork, Todd would come retrieve her, bring her inside of a two-story garage on the property, and force her to perform sexual acts. She would be fed, allowed to use the bathroom once, and given a small container of water to clean herself. She looked for any opportunities to escape, but they never came. For Kayla, time was running out. This was the hell she lived in while authorities were trying to piece together the puzzle of where she and Charles had disappeared to. All the while, Todd's posts on his own Facebook account were getting weirder and weirder, and looking back, his strange and cynical words are very telling. He had some generally questionable posts like this one from September 15th, two weeks after Kayla and Charlie went missing. Reading the news, this person is missing, that person is missing, another person is missing. Oh wait, that person just went to the beach with a friend. Another person found with her parole violation boyfriend. In the event I become missing, please note no one would take me. I eat too much and I'm crabby, they would just bring me back. On September 26th, he once again took to Facebook to rant. In my family, you get backhanded for talking back or being disrespectful. Wonder what the punishment would have been if I had looted, burned cop cars, and threw stuff at people. When I messed up, mom beat my ass. Stepfather beat my ass when he got home. Next time I went to my grandparents, I got my ass beat. You just didn't act up. These kids and adults just don't know. Damn shame, too. They might learn to appreciate if they did. Needless to say, the hypocrisy of this post is pretty ironic considering all the horrible things Todd's done in his life. On September 30th, he posted, Just admit it, you look at the news, you see the political crap and the school shootings and just general WTH is going on. Zombie apocalypse is starting to look better and better every day. On November 3rd, he shared a post that what really a shows just how quick his views was, how he viewed almost every interaction through an angry lens, and really how much he loathed others, or maybe just felt better than everyone else. We need Ebola to come as a huge snowstorm, wipe out half the population, then melt away. Just tired of entitlement, rude-ass people for no reason, people who race to cut in front of you to slam on the brakes to make right turns, 
and that mother that stands in the aisle at the grocery store, and dude, you know who you are, that blocks the aisle checking out the micro brews and blocking everyone on their way to their Michelob. B move. Notice how incredibly furious Todd gets when he feels that he's been personally slighted by random strangers. Remember this because it will become extremely important later on. But despite Todd's obvious temper online, nobody would have expected in a million years what skeletons he had tucked away in his closet. It wasn't until authorities got a search warrant to access Kayla's Facebook account that the picture never? would come together all at once. Investigators began searching the online profile for clues, and that's when they saw conversations between Kayla and Charlie about the job on Todd's property on August 31st. Now police knew what they were doing on that crucial last day, and when they went to trace the pair's phones, their worst fears were confirmed. Neither Kayla nor Charles had ever left the area of Todd's property. Police now knew exactly what they had to do, but not one person was fully prepared for what they might find. At about 8 a.m. on November 3rd, one group of investigators went to Todd's house, where they spoke for a while with the man, both sides remaining a bit guarded, unsure what the other side was hiding. As Todd was questioned about what he knew concerning the missing couple, Kayla and Charlie, he didn't know that another team of investigators was simultaneously arriving at his 95-acre property a few miles away to scour it for evidence. However, at this time, the authorities who were with him did reveal to Todd that they knew the cell phones of the missing persons had last pinged on his property. Todd responded, you're trying to find the girl. The detective corrected him that they were looking for both her and her boyfriend. Guess Todd slipped up there, as he was the only one who knew Charlie was already gone. Um, we have a search warrant, okay? okay. For your residence and your car, okay. okay? We are mainly looking for your cell phone, okay? Well, me or, and at least him need going with you. Meanwhile, not long after arriving on Todd's expansive rural land, the other team of deputies drove down its long gravel road and came upon the two-story garage. When they went inside, they were immediately concerned to see that the makeshift living space was adorned by shackles. But then they came upon the thing that fully stopped them in their tracks. In the bathroom, inside of a lone wastebasket was a pile of hair clippings, reddish brown in color. They warily headed back outside to continue the search, but as the investigators came across Todd's looming shipping container and went to take a closer look, they were suddenly chilled to the bone by a strange noise. Someone was banging on the walls from the inside and they were screaming desperately for help. In that moment, the whole atmosphere changed. Deputies rushed to open the doors, but the container was tightly sealed shut by five heavy padlocks. This unforgettable video captured the few tense minutes where everyone held their breath, as a few men cut and pry open the locks and then, finally, they were in. Watch out, y'all move. The dark box was littered with supplies and crime novels, and in the very back, chained to the wall by her neck, sat a despondent Kayla. On top of the dog bed she'd been made to sleep on for the past two months, barely able to move as her restraints had forced her to stay sitting up almost all the time during her captivity. The investigators try their best to console Kayla as they get bolt cutters to set her free. Just a girl, just a girl. How are you, honey? This is, bolt this, cutters. this is our investor. He's a paramedic. Oh, yeah. Okay, we're going to get you out of there, okay? Just hang loose for me. Anybody got a, I need a handcuff key. Handcuff key. I don't have I got a ring here. Oh, this is fucking destroyed, man. We've got to let him get that photograph. Randy, let, okay. let me see your light, Randy. You can, you can put your hands down. You're okay. We're here, okay? But despite the extended trauma Kayla had just endured, her immediate response to being rescued was clear, coherent, and calmer than anyone could have expected. Her strength in this footage is beyond admirable. Do you know where your buddy is? Yes. He shot him. He shot him? He shot Who him. did? Who shot him? Todd Cole Hepp shot Charlie Carver three times in the chest, wrapped him in a blue tarp, put him in the bucket of the tractor, walked me down here, and I've never seen him again. Okay. He says he's dead and buried. He says there's several bodies dead and buried out here, and he okay. says that the dogs will be ruined if they go looking because there's red pepper. We're going to step you up, sweet dog, because there's what? Okay. Okay. Tell the dog people that. Yeah. No, this is everywhere around the car, the car is presently a ravine onto the land. Okay. The investigators at Todd's house were alerted of the shocking discovery, and they quickly confronted Cole Hep, letting him know the jig was up. They had Kayla, and there was no weaseling his way out of it now. All right, this is where we're at, Mr. Cole Hep. While we were here, all right, 
my sergeant served a search warrant on your property. Okay? We have Kayla. Excuse me? We have Kayla in your property. She was locked in a container. Okay? She has told us that you shot and killed Charlie. Okay? So at this time, I'm going to need you to stand up and put your hands behind he's, your back. He's already cut. Okay. okay. You're under arrest right now for kidnapping. All right? They're going to continue to search your property. They're going to continue. To bring, they got cadaver dogs down there. Okay. okay? If you want to help yourself, tell me where Charlie's at so we can go find his body. That's that's pretty much where we're at right now. Okay. Do you want to help yourself and tell me where the body's at so we can go recover Charlie's body? No, sir. You don't want to? No, sir. Okay. Um, why'd you shoot him? I didn't shoot anybody, sir. Okay, why'd you lock her in a container in your property? I was talking about She's on your property right now, locked in a container. They just got her out of a, like a... Um, they called it a specific name. Connex box. Connex box. She was locked in a container oh, in a Connex oh. box. They got her. We are, we have investigators. We have like 20 investigators on your property right now. Okay. And they have found her in the Connex box. So she never left your property. Okay. Okay. You locked her in the Connex box. And she has told investigators that you shot and killed Charlie. Okay, so I'm trying to give you an opportunity to help yourself and help us help you find this body. Because Charlie, she's saying Charlie's body, you buried Charlie's body on that property. So you're saying you didn't lock her up, you didn't put her in the Connex box or anything? Probably a good thing. Go ahead and put him in the back of your car. Yes, sir. Watching this clip, Todd seems almost frozen by disbelief, like he never thought he'd actually get caught. Authorities soon discovered Charlie's car also on the property, which Todd had spray painted and covered in debris in order to conceal it. It's kind of weird to me that Todd seems to consider himself a criminal mastermind and thought out all these ways to keep his dirty deeds secret, but he didn't even seem to consider the possibility that authorities could ping the victim's phones and find him that way. One sergeant would later say that he feels Todd wanted to get caught so he could have an audience and tell people about his awful crimes. I might have to agree. As she rode in the ambulance, Kayla would reveal more heartbreaking details of her time trapped with Todd. One of the things I found most disgusting was the harrowing way she described she the sexual assaults. Both from the time, wherever, whatever, I don't mean you weren't sexually again. Yeah, I'm not sure if you This is seriously one of the most evil things I could ever imagine. Not only did he do unspeakable things to her without her consent, but it seems like he somehow managed to convince himself that this was not assault, probably in order to feel less guilty and pathetic, and in turn make Kayla feel even more worthless. Simply unbelievable. And it just goes to show, once again, the mental gymnastics a narcissistic person like Todd would do to believe that his victim genuinely wants to be intimate with him even though he's literally putting Kayla's life on the line if she doesn't comply. He apparently also told her that Stockholm Syndrome would kick in and she'd be happy with him, and that he'd planned to build a soundproof room for her to live in long term. Kayla also revealed that Todd liked to brag that he was a serial killer and a mass murderer, and that his dream was to get his body count in the three digits since it was supposedly only in the high two digits so Is far. Like mass Just listen to these bizarre shit, claims that Todd allegedly boasted about to Kayla. I really don't know where the whole killing people for the government thing comes from, but I'd guess it was just a fabrication Todd made up just for the sake of attention. So this was the big case that finally put Todd Colehead behind bars. But as authorities continued speaking with him, they would discover that the rabbit hole of Todd's yeah, life was he's far deeper shit, exactly. and darker and more evil than they could have ever imagined.
First of all, shortly after being taken into custody, Todd would lead police to a site on his property where two more corpses were found. Authorities were shocked to unearth Johnny Coxey and his wife, Megan McGraw Coxey, a young couple who had been missing since December 2015. Autopsies revealed that Megan died from a gunshot wound to the head while her husband received a fatal wound to the torso. To make matters even worse, while it was determined that Johnny had been killed immediately, Megan had been kept alive for six days before Todd brutally murdered her on Christmas. Upon further research, it appears Megan and Johnny had just been released from jail shortly before they went missing. And with various sources reporting that they had a history of panhandling and that their baby tested positive for heroin, you kind of get the feeling that Todd specifically preyed upon people he knew were at a bad place in life and particularly vulnerable. Now, Megan and Johnny may have had problems of their own, but of course, when Todd told the story of how they died, he framed it in a way that made him look like the good guy in the situation. Well, sort of. Todd gave investigators this play-by-play -play in his confession. You pick them up at Blackstock, and you know what? You pick them up at Blackstock and Regal Road, Regal I think you said, and then that's, well, okay, no, that's where I start. I met her there. Okay. Got her number. We talked on the phone for a brief moment. Okay. Then I met them later on at that next to Ricky's Hot Dogs, Big Huge parking lot. They walked across okay. and spoke to me there. Okay. I almost thought she was going to hit on me to actually, come on, I should have been in our car. Um, but that's not what I was there for. I got you. I'm going to tell you, our meeting looked shitty as shit. <laughs> I understand. I mean, I got you because you show up with, with that. In that parking lot? Yeah, and her, kind of the way she was. I understand what you're talking about. Um, basically, offered her the job, offered to let him go in and do it, could work as well. The next day, she was, the next day, this was over several days. The next day, she was in the paper, mug shots. I guess you guys had arrested her for um, meth or some uh, hair, I don't know. Something was in her bloodstream, and you took her kids away. Okay. I asked her about it, and she informed me that, yeah, she had drug issues and with that. Okay. I still was gonna give him a chance. You know what? I get shit happens to people it's hard. I get it. And I picked him up and I drove him to my land of it kid supplies mm -hmm. and got him down to my that's building. A fucking moron. And that's when Johnny pulled a knife out mm -hmm. and you shot. I shot. What did you do with his knife? I don't know. I don't keep that kind of crap. You just threw it out? Yeah, that's right. Okay. I... What did she do when you shot Johnny? What did she do when Johnny pulled the knife out? What did nothing. she say? Nothing. So you think she was planning on the planning of this? I think she entirely was in the plan of it. Okay. There was, there was no... Oh, sh Yeah. Uh, Johnny, what are you doing? There was mm -hmm. none of that. This was... Her actions were... She knew he was doing that. Mm-hmm. They saw a guy who had a load of money, drove mm -hmm. a car they can't afford. Mm -hmm. They didn't have a car, and they were going to get something. So then you shot him how many times? Shot him twice okay. in the chest. Okay. He dropped forward. Mm -hmm. He dropped forward. I went around him and put another one through a spinal column. Okay, and you shot her? Not exactly. Do you believe Todd's version of events? To me, it seems like he could have easily done the exact same thing to this couple as he did to Kayla and Charles. Just attack them unprovoked in order to keep the female party to himself. Even the way he tells the tale seems like an excuse to humble brag about how much money he has. After all the heartless crimes Todd has committed against innocent people, I just don't know if I can buy this. But it is true that Megan and Johnny had a sketchy record and it's not too unbelievable that they could have tried something. Either way, I really doubt that Todd was very upset when he got the opportunity to kill. Next, Todd goes on some random tangents about how his property and storage container was never supposed to be used for such gruesome purposes, which is just a pretty bizarre topic to ruminate on after everything he's done. The Connex was not meant to be a cage. Okay. All that changed was after the fact. Okay. Connex was designed for my food, and my weapons, and to secure my four-wheeler before I had the building built. Okay. The back area that's all wood, mm -hmm. that wasn't designed for them. Mm -hmm. That was designed for my stuff. Okay. Until last week, there was no ceiling on that. Okay. I put that in because she was cold. Kayla was cold. 
And Todd just loves talking about all this Yeah, stuff. bro, this guy is like... Clean out the back area. Because mm -hmm. I had... He there. thinks he's cooking, mm -hmm. like, across the board. Um, and at one time, those ammo racks weren't there. The ammo rack was here and here. Mm -hmm. Pistol rifle. Okay. You know, I had chain around. There's lots of chain in that building. Mm -hmm. I use chain for all kinds of shit. There's chain in the, in, in the woods where I've got trees with come alongs that are sort of lean towards my fence. Mm -hmm. And I'll put a chain around it, hook a come along to it, and start uh -huh. it this way. And over uh -huh. time, it'll fall over <laughs> right. my fence. Okay. Uh, so, chain and cable and that kind of stuff, I got a lot of it. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's pause right here. Todd is obviously very proud of all his gear, and he clearly has kidnapping down to a science. But before we go any further with Megan's story, you need to see the backstory to all this equipment. And it's actually probably the most bizarre thing about this entire case, the Amazon reviews. Yep, that's right. When investigators looked into Todd's internet activity, they discovered something absolutely insane. Todd had been buying the tools for his crimes out in the open on Amazon, and he left public reviews where he described exactly what he was using them for. The crazy part is, anybody who read these creepy reviews probably laughed it off as just some dark humor. On a master Wait. padlock review, the review read, Solid locks have five on a shipping container. Won't stop them, but sure will slow them down till they're too old to care. On a fixed blade, haven't stabbed anyone yet, yet, but I am keeping the dream alive, and when I do, it will be with a quality tool like this. On a master lock, works great. Also, if someone talks back, go old school on them by putting this in a sock and beating them. They will not appreciate the hardened steel like you will. Works great on, looks like he said shipping container. Keep in car for when you have to hide the bodies and you left the full size shovel at home. Does not come with a midget, which would have been nice. Works excellent. Getting the neighbor to stand still while you chase him with it is hard enough without having an easy to use chainsaw. It's blacker <laughs> than my soul and priced right. There was even a review that read, now my locks have locks. Place is Hotel California now. Guess Todd was a big fan of that song. What would you have thought if you saw these on Amazon? Would you have been concerned or just brushed it off? I Either way, it off, all of Todd's reviews just further demonstrate how smart and funny he fancies himself as, and how much he wanted to brag about his crimes, even if he had to do it in this roundabout well, way. Well, brush it off, but also but found it forward creepy. With Todd's Both 2015 them. crime, this next clip is very disturbing and disgusting. As Todd describes how he decided what to do with Megan, it really feels like he views his victims as nothing more than objects which he can dispose of whenever it gets inconvenient for him. I don't know what to do with it, man. Um... One side, I really want to drop her. The next side, I really... It's not I'm I kind of want to save her ass. Let me back up real quick before we go that far. Because we were talking about Johnny. Okay. The girl that was with Johnny, did you shoot her? Not at that time. Okay, what happened with her? She panicked, and then she sat, I told her to sit down. She sat down. Mm -hmm. uh, went ahead and cuffed her. Mm -hmm. I had her down. Mm -hmm. Told her I wasn't going to hurt her. Mm -hmm. uh, she calmed down, mm -hmm. and I actually took her to the Connex. No, that's not true. I had her lay there for what I didn't know what to do with her. Um, I didn't want her in my Connex because I had stuff in there I didn't know what the hell to do with it. Mm -hmm. Putting her in with my guns is not a good idea. No, I understand that. Uh, I actually had to go. For the first time, I ever had a little bit of a panic of what the hell do I do with her. Mm -hmm. uh, put her here, put her there, drop her. What the hell do I do? Do I call the cops? I got legal guns. Uh, I told her I wasn't going to touch her, wasn't going to her, wasn't going to her, uh, just calm the hell down and let me sort this shit out. Mm -hmm. Somewhere between I did that, I, well, I shot him, set the, the back tight in the back, got her to calm down, and kept coming back and forth trying to figure out what to do, but I had her cuffed mm -hmm. and she wouldn't go anywhere. Eventually I went and, I want to say I left her on that floor for a while. I left her on that floor cuffed. I wouldn't because mm -hmm. I didn't know what to do with her. I didn't want her in the building. Okay. Got the tractor, got it out of there, picked the body up, and was trying to figure out what the hell to do with it. This um, is Johnny's body? Yeah. Okay. Um, uh huh. Like I said, I was held with a melt. And listen to how much more concerned he is about losing his sanctuary than he is about murdering people. The lamb is supposed to be my sanctuary. Yeah, not my killing field. Right. <laughs> I understand. It's not meant to be my killing field. Uh -huh. um, it was supposed to be the place where I go to relax and get away from people and not deal with this shit. Mm -hmm. um, this, this killing way bothered because it was such needless bull uh, Hell, I was giving him money. Why were you mm -hmm. robbing me? He thinks this violence was all needless and stupid. Pretty ironic considering all the people he's killed out of petty personal grudges. You'll see what I mean soon enough. 
It's all about what works for Todd. He goes on to nonchalantly describe burying Johnny, saying, It was a lot more work than you think. Then he wasn't sure what to do with Megan. I tied her up, left her there, while I tried to figure out what to I, I didn't know what to do with it, man. Right. Um, got rid of Johnny, came back, left her there, went and got food, fed the girl. Uh, fed her after she tried to rob you? Man, what are you going to do with her? I don't want to shoot her. I understand. I mean, I can't have some crazy bad woman going back up. I mean, she was going bipolar left and right. She wouldn't calm down, like. Oh, she probably calmed down. But she would, when she was talking to me, and first she had drug issues. Right. And then she kept going off the deep end with weird shit and kept talking, and then she kept telling me that she had manic, manic mode or some sort of bipolar lithium crap. I don't know what the hell it was. Where, she, I mean, she was up, down, up, down, up, down. So she didn't mellow out like Kayla did. No, not at all. Bro, this guy, act, oh my god, this guy. But she wasn't upset. What made you decide to shoot her? I'll get to that. Okay. Mm. It's clear from the way Todd tells this story, almost with a sort of glee, that he has no remorse. Even here, when the investigator tries to get him to cut to the chase and tell them why he shot Megan, he just said, I'll get to that. Like this is some juicy drama he's been dying to share. Then he complains about all the stuff he bought for Megan while keeping her captive. Uh, I wasn't going to shoot her. Okay. I was going to give her money. I don't know why the hell she went the hell off. I held her. I hate the kidnapping part. I get another one. I held her in there for a couple days. How many days? Five or six. Every, every other damn day, she wanted Little Caesar's Pizza. I hate that shit. Look at the heartburn. Little Caesar's Pizza, Mountain Dew, not Mountain Dew. Dr. Pepper, cinnamon rolls, and freaking Newports. If you go down to my building, you'll find an unused package of Newports that I bought for her. And then he went back. She took. She tried to light my damn building on fire. Do you know how? In the back of what building? The Connex. And then this part is just kind of weird. While telling the investigators where they can find the cigarettes, he bought Megan in the storage container. He says something extremely weird and unprompted. Oh, there's a collar in there? That collar was Kayla's. Neck collar? Yeah, she had me order it. She asked you to order it? Yes, sir. Okay. It, we'll get to that in a minute. Didn't okay. use it, because after, after it came in the mail, mm -hmm. I would tell it went, oh. Okay. That's shit you need for me. <laughs> it, it, it's a stainless steel collar with, like, hooks for putting, like, locks on. I mean, <laughs> dude, it's like having your, I don't treat my dogs that way. Okay, so let me explain the backstory for this one, because it's really strange. What? And I was very confused at first, too. Todd actually claimed that Kayla had been writing letters to him while she was in captivity, asking for intercourse, with Todd himself even telling a reporter, I'm not saying she's not a victim, she's not the victim she portrays. I mean, it turned into Fifty Shades of Grey with bodies. So I guess that's where this supposed caller comes in. Because you made this comment to me, sorry to interrupt, but you made this comment to me. And I believe you. Well, ain't nobody begging that guy for anything, bro. I'm gonna keep it as a book. And, and I believe you. And I talked to the solicitor about that. Mm -hmm. And and I told him what you told me. I, I said he's he's made the comment to me, solicitor. He'll plead to everything. Mm -hmm. But he's not pleading mm -hmm. because he didn't do it. I said he told me that he's admitted to everything he's done. He's willing to take the responsibility for it. Mm -hmm. But he will not take responsibility for the kidnapping. I said, but he will not take responsibility for. The because he did not give her. Mm -hmm. The time they had sex, it was consensual. Mm -hmm. She had the choice, and she actually initiated it at times. Mm -hmm. And he said, okay. I said, so we're going to need to re-interview her. <clears throat> and we're setting that up. Yeah, we're going to do that this week. I told him, I said, I, I gave him my word that we would re-interview him, and I want to re or we want to re-interview her. Mm -hmm. Because I, I think it needs to be done. She had me get her vibrator, the TV, the, the DVD player, the MP3 player. The yeah, it's just baiting you. Yeah, like, it's just like That's obvious. Like, if you don't books? get that, you're I just like a random. Okay. Dude, I didn't question. I just. It got her to shut up and got her to roll over. 
Uh, oh, that, that led me to something else. I was you said the satanic book? Yeah, what the hell, man? I never... Let me ask you this. The mattress is up against the wall. And we did that, looking to see if there were any weapons in there. There was a bag. Yeah, did you ever spend the night there with her in the bed? Like, stay the night, you and her in the bed? Overnight? Never stay the night. Okay. Um, we spent a lot of time on the bed. She wanted the... The, 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 the comfort thing that was on the floor, mm -hmm. that was her idea. That was her submissive kitty bed, her kitten bed. Man, it tripped me out. All of a sudden, she, I, I put the collar thing on her. And yeah, they found me out. They were like, what? they thought it was for a dog, you know. Well, now the cage that was up there that was in pieces, mm -hmm. that I built, and it was originally meant for my dogs. Yeah, no, I'm talking about the, the, collar, the, the metal collar thing you told me about. That I ordered off mm -hmm. of one of the websites delivered, and I got it because she want, she requested that as opposed to me putting the chain around. Mm -hmm. And I got that and went, mm -mm. I, I went, that ain't going on no way. Yeah. Uh, but she wanted that and then the, the, the kitty bed, and she went this whole thing of ex explaining to me that I had to. Yo, this is the Yapatron. Mm -hmm. Give her permission yeah. to look at me. Mm -hmm. Dude, I don't do all that control. Uh, you know, I'm like. Ask Ashley. Ashley's never had to deal with any of that crap. Yeah, it was just, I don't know. She, 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 she had all this stuff. She kept asking for this kind of stuff. I got it. And she wanted it. It's a big black book, about that deep. Mm -hmm. Like $23 of that damn book. Mm -hmm. And it's the Enchanted Sorcerer, Sorcery, so mm -hmm. It's the how to guide to be a witch. Dude, I just figured she'd read the damn book and she up for a while. Kayla has before asked me to beat up people for her or use my resources, which she thinks my resources are go get someone killed. Really? Yeah. With people that she doesn't like. A, he have, a have you do or have you hired what? somebody to do it? Yes. Both? Yes. Okay. Um, matter of fact, read my Facebook. You may be on there. Really? Yes. You know, How long ago was this? You know, I, well, I blocked her after all this so that it wouldn't know because I mean literally well we have her Facebook page then you have it okay uh, it'll take you forever a damn day to go through it okay but go back to the messages really uh, and her phone messages she supposedly had money in her car and the guy took her money but that's cold and then she wanted me to either use my resources to either have him killed mm -hmm. um, or beat up I believe he was beat up but she wanted me to use my resources to had him had him off or go do it. Kayla uses that thing between her legs to get dumbasses to go do stupid. And that's what I'm trying to say that she's going to use that to get Dustin hurt. So yeah, I'm just going to leave it at that out of respect for the victim. Yeah. But I haven't seen any of those letters or anything to suggest Kayla was there consensually. What I will say is that even if such letters existed, who's to say that Kayla wasn't just appealing to Todd's ego to stay in his good graces and save her own life? After all, she herself has stated, I realized it was easier if he thought things were going his way, so I made him think whatever I had to. Plus, Todd had reportedly warned Kayla that there was a woman who he'd kidnapped before her who hadn't been so lucky to make it out with her life, which brings us back to Megan. Unsurprisingly, Todd said a gross and totally unnecessary sexual remark about Megan, too, during his confession. Told her basically that if she would just chill the hell out. Mm -hmm. You don't know me. You don't know very much about me. You don't have sh And last time I could check from what was online, she had a warrant when they were looking for her ass. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll give you any warrant for $4,000. I'll drive you up to damn Tennessee. I'll drop your ass off somewhere. If you got any common sense on this planet, you'll go left and I'll go right. What'd she say? Oh, she got so excited, I got my sucked. She did? Oh, yeah. this guy, mm -hmm. dude. It wasn't bad. I told her I would give her four thousand dollars and basically release her in Tennessee. Just go. Yes. Yeah, so go. Cringe, come back. dude. It's cringy and horribly sickening at the same time to hear him talk so proudly about these things. It's like he thinks the investigators are his buddies, which just shows how large his ego truly is. He goes on to say that he thought his plan to set Megan free would work since she didn't really know who he was, and because of her sketchy background, she probably wouldn't want to go to law enforcement for help. But somewhere along the line, Todd changed his mind. With Megan, you, you, you made her the offer of the $4,000. 
keep your mouth shut, I'll take you to Tennessee. Drop you off and leave you. Drop you off and leave you. You go one way, I'll go the other way. Totally. What made that change? What happened? What do you mean what made that change? Well, she ended up dead. Oh, you mean what, what were preceded? Yeah. That <laughs> yeah. I wanted to get rid of her. The weather went. Mm-hmm. Uh, we were having sleet. It's right before Christmas, man. We were having sleet. We were having rain. Mm -hmm. The weather went to sh Okay. And I still had to find a way to get away from Ashley, my girlfriend, mm -hmm. long enough to get up out of work, get this person to Tennessee, drop her off, and get home. That's not a, that's uh -huh. not just a couple hour trip. No. And if I'm dropping her, it ain't gonna be at work. Mm -hmm. We're going north of Nashville. I want her way the hell away from me. She was gonna take. She was happy. She was happy as hell for like. Two days. Okay. She was happy as hell. I just couldn't get past the weather. Okay. The last day, I went over there, uh, opened the connex up. She burned half the freaking building. Uh, this, I mean, she took my ammo racks and grabbed them and did this. Oh, I'm going to tell you, I'm not, for, for such a mm -hmm. Damn. So then what happened? Uh, well, there was ammo everywhere and stuff everywhere, and she broke the fan. I, I, I got her a fan. She broke the fan. Mm -hmm. Prime. I mean, it just can't be that two or two day shipping. There's a fan in there now, but it came as a two pack. Mm -hmm. uh, I had her those to get air ventilation. Mm -hmm. I got lanterns for her so she had light. Mm -hmm. I did the best I could to make it right. somewhat livable. Mm -hmm. Got her blankets, got her pillows. She lit the damn thing on fire. I'm surprised she didn't fix the gate. Well, that's what I was thinking. I'm surprised she didn't. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, when I walked in the building, I mean, I was choking. Went to get her out, and then all of a sudden, it's like I had a caged animal on my hands. I don't know what the hell. What the hell <laughs> oh, that's what I was from. thinking. I'm so freaking happy in the world to be, I'm going to go to Tennessee with money, and I'm going to restart my life, and thank you, thank you, thank you, mm -hmm. to bad crazy. At that point, I tried to walk her out of the building. I just had enough. I walked outside. I was trying to calm down. Her, what the hell to do with her? What to do with her? What to do with her? I didn't know. Mm -hmm. I came back in the building. Um, she was going nuts. It wasn't like she was emotional about the situation. This this had been days. It wasn't much about that. It was just like serious chemical imbalance. And she walked outside. I walked her, I walked her outside. I walked her outside. I put a 40 in the back of her head. What gun did you shoot her with? Same one. That you shot mm -hmm. Johnny, Johnny with, mm -hmm. and that's a Glock. And that's the same one you shot, Charlie. Charlie. It's not even my favorite gun. It's just it's just it's a it's a handy it's gun. A handy one. It's very effective, especially if you shoot 180 grains. And sadly, that's how things ended for Megan. Todd's temper got out of control, and just like that, Mr. Nice Guy was no more. Later on, a former co-worker of Megan actually revealed that the victim had met Todd while working at her Waffle House job. And when authorities started digging deeper, they were told that Todd would act so creepy at the restaurant, inviting waitresses to his home and leaving large tips in a bid to get their attention. That a male cook actually started taking Todd's orders whenever he'd come in, just to keep the waitresses safe and more comfortable. Another detail concerning Todd's romantic life that will send a shiver down your spine is something Kayla revealed when rescued. So apparently Todd had had an ongoing relationship with a woman named Holly for about 10 years. Sources say it was an affair and that she was actually the person who paid for the storage container Kayla was trapped in. But Holly never suspected that her lover was hiding a gruesome second life from her, saying only that he gave her a lot of attention and made her feel very important. However, when Holly found out about Kayla's kidnapping and watched the footage of her being transported to the hospital, she was left speechless at this line. Some girl named Holly is supposedly planning to kill her. Who knows how many more victims could have fallen prey to Todd if authorities hadn't stepped in to stop him. Even Kayla could have been days or hours away from becoming another voiceless victim of Todd's unpredictable wrath. But you know, all these stories of how creepy Todd was while also simultaneously being a respected businessman in the area really caught my attention. But to understand how this masked monster was made, I had to take a look back at his early years, and although the unspeakable things he did even back then left me at a loss for words, it all led up to his most brutal crime of all, a quadruple homicide, one that plagued and puzzled the community for 13 years, and wasn't solved until Todd Proud how many pumps, how many pumps? during his interrogation. We'll be going over that infuriating footage next, but first, you really need to understand the absolute disaster that was Todd's childhood. Todd was born in Florida in 1971, but raised in South Carolina and Georgia. He didn't have the most normal childhood as his parents' marriage was crumbling and they were divorced when he was still a baby. 
Growing up, Todd reportedly loathed his stepfather and wanted to live with his biological dad, despite having seemingly no contact with him for about eight years. And because of these unfortunate circumstances, or maybe something that had always been broken within him, Todd started to behave in very concerning ways early on. He was violent towards other children and showed signs of severe emotional and mental instability. He would destroy classmates' property at school and was actually sent to a mental facility at the age of nine due to his sudden explosions of anger. Throughout this counseling, Todd was described as being preoccupied with sexual content at a disturbingly young age. If you're a true crime fan, then this won't be surprising to you How at many all, pumps, but Todd was also known to be extremely cruel to animals as a child, often a telltale sign of a psychopath. Not only did he heartlessly shoot a dog with a BB gun, but he also killed a goldfish with Clorox bleach because he wanted a gerbil instead. He even locked another young boy in a dog crate and rolled the cage while laughing until the child was in tears and begging him to stop. Todd's father would later lament that the only emotion his son was capable of was anger. His mother must have been well aware of this as well, because she later described locking him in his room at night and placing locks on her own bedroom door just in case he decided to try anything. She also said he stabbed a little girl on the school bus in the leg with scissors to get back at her, destroyed a bunch of new furniture his mother bought him with a hammer, and even threatened to kill her. Still, in 1983, Todd got his wish of reuniting with his biological father after purportedly threatening to kill himself otherwise. But this ended up being just another bad influence on Todd, as the man apparently taught the boy how to blow things up. But despite bonding over shared interests, living with his father didn't play out like Todd had dreamed it would. The man's frequent absence due to his many girlfriends left Todd thinking it would be better to return to his mother. But at this point, she made excuses to prevent this. This clip from Todd's police interview shed some light on his rocky relationship with his father. My dad took me to office parks while he would still have to get his hands on and then want me to help him load truck and deal with his nonsense and then would tell me that if I got into a fight, if I didn't win, you're not my son, don't come home. But then if I get into a fight, I whoop the kid's ass, I went too far. I'm getting my ass whooped because I went too far. Also in his 2016 interrogation, Todd spoke on a shocking incident he got into around this same time of his teenage years. You had mentioned to your mom mm -hmm. and that we, when we had talked at the jail that there were others and you told your mom she didn't have enough hands. I had some altercations in Arizona. Okay. Um, I don't remember all the details. I had a friend of mine that got shot come out, coming out of a alleyway. Okay. I found the guy later on. Who was your friend that got shot? Uh, Michael something. I was a kid. I don't remember. Michael something. Do you remember this guy is like a Gapatron Supreme. I never knew it. He just doesn't he stop talking. It's insane. He, he drove a Nova, gray Nova. What year was that, do you think? Well, how old were you? 14. You were 14. What's the thing? Okay. Um, and my, my understanding is there was some kid who wanted to be in a gang and was doing his initiation. And his initiation was to shoot your friend? We were just two kids coming out of an alley. We weren't part of nothing. We were part of nothing. That was his initiation? Yes, sir. Wow. And so, in October 1986, Todd was still in Arizona living <laughs> with his dad when his violent tendencies would extend to a new extreme. He was only 15 years old, but he managed to lure a 14-year-old neighbor girl whom he had a crush on out of her home by saying her boyfriend wanted to speak to her. Then he held a gun to her head, brought her home, tied her hands with rope, taped her mouth shut, and sexually assaulted her. After this, he walked her home and threatened her not to tell anyone what had just happened, or else he would kill her little brother and sister. Luckily, somebody ultimately did call the police, and when Todd was apprehended, the first thing he had to say was, How much time am I going to get for this? And get this, what Todd explained fuck? that his motive for the disgusting crime had been because he was mad at his father, who was out of town and wanted to rebel. At this time, he was diagnosed with borderline personality disorder. Okay, now I want to take a brief moment to touch on Todd's late mother, because some of the things she said about her son's behavior are a bit odd to me. Before he was sentenced for this crime, she wrote to an adult probation officer pleading for leniency on Todd. According to Greenville News, she claimed that the incident had brought her and her son closer together, as he wrote her frequently while in jail, musing, You know, it's strange. Maybe a little good does come from some bad. She also wrote, They don't stop to think that he even walked the girl home. Does that sound like a dangerous criminal? He even walked the girl home. 
While she may have had decent intentions, I just feel like a statement like this would be a slap in the face to the teenage victim and her family. Ultimately, it was recommended that Todd be tried as an adult, with one neighbor even describing him as a devil on a chain. And here's what I find really interesting. When evaluated, Todd was found to show deep emotional disturbance, but not psychosis. This would seem to suggest that Todd was not, in fact, out of touch with reality, which makes his detached behavior that much more chilling. Overall, the psychiatrist determined that Todd had an inflated ego and was extremely rebellious towards authority, someone who generally feels like he should be in control. And there's one other key element that might play an underlying role in all of these big ideas Todd holds about himself, his IQ. When tested, Todd was found to have an above average IQ of 118, although interestingly, his high school teacher reported poor academic performance. It seems to me like Todd just felt like he was better than everyone, above the rest of the crowd, Classic. and rather than apply his intelligence towards positive goals, he used it to manipulate people and orchestrate heinous crimes. In this case, even the juvenile probation officer would end up recommending adult incarceration as they did not think Todd's deep-seated issues could be solved easily, and Todd agreed to plead guilty to kidnapping in exchange for the sexual assault charges to be dropped. If that's infuriating to you, you're not alone, as one probation officer went so far as to say this was a travesty of justice. Another official declared that Todd had little to no conscience and presented the greatest risk to the community. It appeared that Todd believed the world owed him something. Very few held hope that he could be rehabilitated. Well, as much as we can wish someone had locked Todd up for longer so he couldn't hurt anyone else, that wasn't the case. Unfortunately, he only received a 15-year sentence, and when he got out at 30 years old, he moved back to South Carolina and was placed on the sex offender registry. Interestingly, while incarcerated, Todd had only been cited for violent behavior in the first few years of his stay, but throughout his 20s, he had no other records of disobedience, almost like Todd had learned how to put on a friendly act in order to get what he wanted. Upon release, Todd hit the ground running, paving a new life for himself. He had earned a bachelor's degree in computer science while in prison, and in 2002 he got a job as a graphic designer for a sports apparel company. Todd went on to get another degree in business administration marketing, and in 2006 he applied to receive a real estate license. But there was one little problem. Applicants were required to explain any history of criminal convictions in order to obtain the license. However, Todd had a clever plan. There was no background check in place, and so when Todd explained the felony on his record, he twisted things to sound way better for him than the reality. He painted it as a petty argument between his teenage self and his girlfriend, saying they broke up, and then her dog got loose, and then when they were looking for it, the girl's parents got worried and called police. He said the only reason he had a gun was due to concerns over gangs in the Phoenix area, and that the kidnapping charge was due to him telling her not to move while they talked this out. So, yeah, just a complete top. lie, but a very deliberate one which fit all the parameters that would reasonably explain his charges without revealing the awful, ugly crime he actually committed. Well, this fabrication worked out for Todd, and after getting his bearings in the real estate scene, he even started his own business called TKA Real Estate, which employed about a dozen agents. His career was booming, and on the surface, he seemed like a pretty charismatic, hardworking guy to those <coughs> around him. But still, his darker side leaked through the cracks at times, and people soon started to take notice. Co-workers were very uncomfortable with how he would casually watch inappropriate adult videos at work for hours. What? Some women felt uneasy at the sexual innuendos he made to them. He even made a distasteful joke on his firm's website that he motivated workers by not feeding them. Apparently, he was very open about his status as a sex offender, but would claim the charges stemmed from a girl's dad getting mad and overreacting after the teens took a joyride together. Again, very far from the truth. But all the same, Todd had glowing reviews, was described by many associates as very personable, and even got recognized as the top-selling rookie agent in his region at one point. All in all, his strange habits and unusual quirks were chalked up to, well, just that. So it wouldn't be until his 2016 confession that authorities would find out a brutal and high-profile quadruple homicide that they'd been struggling to solve since 2003 had been all Todd's doing. Now, can, what I want you to do is tell me from the very beginning about Superbikes. It was a warm afternoon in November 2003, Spartanburg County, when an unsuspecting customer walked into the store, Superbike Motorsports, only to be faced with a horrifyingly gruesome scene. All the employees staffing the shop had been shot to death. Terrified, the customer quickly called the police, who hurried over to inspect the bloodbath. Okay, and what's the problem? Apparently, yeah, everybody's where the pumps at? Here. Everybody's laying down. We're in a pool of blood. His mama's been shot, the mechanic's been shot. And the owner. 
The victims were quickly identified as the shop's owner, his mother, and two young workers. But as much as their devastated loved ones grieved and hoped for justice, the killer behind such an audacious and reckless shooting somehow managed to slip through the cracks. And as years went by and authorities racked their brains fruitlessly for answers, going down a few dead ends in the process, they had no idea that the real monster behind this notorious unsolved crime was hiding right under their noses the whole time as a respected member of the community. And so, in this 2016 interrogation, they're finding out the full extent of what really happened that dark day at the motor shop, and the real motive was probably the last thing they ever expected. So, go ahead, you bought the bike. Bought the bike. Uh, I tried to ride it, didn't work either way. Um, key points. Um, had it 14 days, and it got stolen from the front of the apartment complex. You said you went back to them? Uh, before it got stolen, I had gone back to them uh, a few days prior to being stolen and told them that I was having a hard time writing it, and I was not so sure I had made a wise decision. And you went back to them because you were inexperienced, and what else did you say? I, I thought it was a bad decision. I was trying to see if I could possibly trade it in for a smaller bike <clears throat> or something of that nature. Maybe I just, I didn't know how to ride it. Uh, they were, please understand this has been many, many years. Um, they proceeded to give me more on the rude side about uh, my inability to, to, to ride a, that kind of bike. No one ever taught me. So, I mean, I did not operate the clutch. And the possibility of them coming by at some time with the trailer and maybe I had to make up my mind that they, they had dropped it off at the apartment. Okay. So they knew, they knew exactly where it was stored because the guy brought it over to me. So you said they knew where it was stored? They knew it was stored. Okay. Because they had dropped it off there. Okay. Uh, two, three days later, it came up missing. There was a police report. As far as I know, they never found the bike. It's pretty obvious that Todd's anger stems from him being miffed at what he saw as the employees looking down on him. And for some reason, that seems to be the one thing Todd just can't tolerate. Watch here as he even gets sidetracked to complain about the police not taking him seriously when he reported the motorcycle theft. You said I made a police report? I did. Actually, the law enforcement officer made fun of me. He informed me that that's, that's, that's a shame that got stolen before I, before I got a chance to write you a ticket. That was the one time I didn't like you guys. Todd says a little while after that incident cooled down, he was once again making visits to the motorcycle shop. Got to Jones again for motorcycle and started going back to the shop. During one of my times over there, sitting on one of the, I believe it was the manager, the owner's friend, guy was a bit of an asshole. I was looking at the bikes and trying to let the earlier part go, and the manager started making some comments about the last one being stolen, and he okay. said something. There's something about mine was on its way to mine was on its way to Florida. I have no idea it was in Florida or why he said that. When he said it, it was obviously he was not talking about the time when I asked him about possibly selling it. It, it was implied that we took your. Sh oh, the pilot of saw the time being. Got mad about it. <clears throat> kept going out there. Why I kept going to the same bike place, I don't really know. But I'd go out there, sit on the bikes, and listen to these two, the owner and the manager, basically talk trash. I find this part so intriguing because even Todd himself admits he doesn't know why he would keep going back to the bike shop if the employee's attitudes bothered him so much. Part of me feels like he just wanted a reason to get more and more agitated, so he'd feel justified in what he was about to do. To the workers, Todd was just some weird customer who kept coming in and acting strange, but they never could have predicted the absolutely evil plan that was simmering just below the surface. Water burn 92 cool. FS. Cool, power table, back to the water, that's what I'm doing right now. 92. 92 FS. FS. Uh, nine millimeter, at the time those only had 10 round mags because they had so had limitation and the aftermarket pro mags were god awful. So how many, so you had 10, what, 10 round magazine? Yes sir, three of them. Three 10 round magazines? Mm -hmm. Although I've got quite a few of those Kydex, mm -hmm. they work very well. Uh, Bravo concealment, mm -hmm. I highly recommend them. He gives a long-winded explanation about suppressors. A suppressor would shoot on a semi-automatic, requires a Nielsen device, also as a RAD, on recoil assist, if you have a movable barrel. 
Okay. Otherwise, you have to use the spacer and lock it. You're having some problems with the suppressor. <laughs> you're going to have to say that. Button. He's understanding it, and you're just going, okay. Yeah. <laughs> and then declares that he made his own. Dependability surpasses everything else. Okay. Years later, I actually learned how to make them myself, and actually mine were pretty yeah. dependable. Then what happened? Uh, it's almost funny how the investigators just cut Todd off whenever he starts to ramble about his accomplishments. I feel like a big motivator for Todd was getting the recognition he felt he deserved. So these utter dismissals during his big moment to tell his story probably feel like a big letdown. Anyways, here's where Todd no, finally doing... tells the methodical timeline from the day of the crime. I left college, left my class, okay. drove to Bowen Springs, put the shoulder holster on at the CVS parking lot. I'm not going to worry about the school. Got there. Not everybody was there. Went in... Uh, sat on a few bikes, did my usual, and doing my best to make sure that the pain customers were not there. Collateral damage is not cool. Todd really harps on the point that he didn't want to kill paying customers, which seems to be his way of painting himself as a sort of anti-hero, like he really seems to relish in viewing himself through this lens. You said you were waiting on what? This was during the time, as you know, that it was not busy. Mm -hmm. That shows time that was not after work when I would have a lot of people in there. Um, did not want to shoot other people. It's kind of funny. Kay would put on her paperwork when she was writing stuff out to me that she found a killer with a conscience and a kidnapper with morals. Whatever the hell that meant. You remember that? Yeah. So I just said, I did yeah, not. I, after she said, I, I spent a lot of time thinking, going, wow, kind of, okay. So as Todd waited for who he judged as innocent people to leave, he was also waiting for one of the employees who he felt wronged him to show up. Once he was alone with the workers, Todd says he asked to buy a bike so that the mechanic would take it back to prep it. And then he says one of the most outrageous things the police have probably ever heard. That was one big building. Yeah. I cleared it in under 30 seconds. You what now? I cleared that building in under 30 seconds. You guys would have been proud. I'm sorry, but you guys would have been proud. The interrogators brush off his comment and his story continues. He says he first went to the back where the mechanic was prepping a bike. Okay. Walked up, pulled out the Beretta, put the safety off, shot the mechanic twice. Now, now I remove this and then I put it back on the main grid, right? He was he was beneath me. Right? He was down, crashed down on the, this side of the bike. Bike was here, I'm on this side. So I had to lean over the bike and I believe it was two, two yeah, shots. Here he brags about how good his shots were. I got him in two long, two long shots. Okay. I got each long. You got him in two long shots? Yes, sir. If you can get it from that, I'm impressed. Do I bother removing it, or is it okay if it then stays? Unprompted, it? he offers oh, up the reason why sure authorities not. weren't able to find fingerprints in order to brag once again. The okay. reason why you didn't get any fingerprints is on the door, I used my knuckles instead of my hand, my hand to open the door. And the reason you have no prints on any of the shell casings mm -hmm. is I wear two pairs of gloves when loading every firearm, even in practice. Okay. Even my practice, I am not doesn't get finger blinds. That's why I don't have to worry about picking up shell casings. If you wear one pair, you can still have a lame print because of the acids in your finger in regard to that. Well, this guy thinks he's like, he's like a ball or something like that. It's insane. The house, that you touch first before you touch it. You can't this guy just wants, this guy just wishes that he's, he would get like a little bit of praise right now from the fucking police people. It's insane. It causes friction between the two. He's like, please, dude, praise me, dude. So when you're talking about what you're talking about, like text gloves? Yes, sir. But if you wear two pairs, not one, uh, one pair won't work. So you use two pair of gloves? Yes, sir. Latex gloves. After that, Todd went to find the other victims. Okay. At that time, all three, manager, owner, and the mom, it's they had heard gunshots in the back and were coming this way to figure out what had happened. I had, all of a sudden, I had three people in front of me. of water. Mom was the closest, and I shot her two to three times in the chest. Not my best work. Her pattern was horrible. Should have shot that over to get the doctor. Three. At her being there, I my pattern was horrible. And the... Yes. Not my best work. The pattern was horrible. You can truly see Todd's narcissistic side coming out in these words especially. The whole thing was just like a game to him, and he really wants these officers to be impressed. She, she, she told him. the son and manager, son, the, the owner and the manager 
ran for the door. At that range, they should have ran to me, not away. They were way too close. When I came around that door, it was boom, three people right there. Okay, so then what happened? They ran to the door. They ran to the door. Um, in the process of that, mm -hmm. I emptied, topped a few rounds, topped one, I don't know which one was oh, which. In the, in the process. process of them running. Of them running. I topped. You can almost see Todd's impatience here. He really wants to tell his story. It's like this confession is the performance of his lifetime, and he doesn't look too happy to get interrupted. Luckily, any time he tries to go off on a tangent, the investigators pretty much ignore it and bring him back to the straight facts of the case. Then proceeded to go, did a reload. Mm -hmm. While this guy was still running, this guy, but I, when I hit him, mm -hmm. he crumpled into the doorway. Okay. When I did my reload, the power. before this guy got out, mm -hmm. I put two in him before, he, before, and he actually fell outside. That was a very fast reload. Todd says he might have put an extra round in the guy who fell by the door as he walked over him, but he's not sure. And then he says something so chilling and insensitive, I almost couldn't believe my ears. At any point, did anybody, I mean, was there, there was nobody else. Okay, there was nobody else. But was the pet rats. Did anybody, as they were falling, I mean, did they, did they look at you? Did they face you? Did, did they say anything to you? Was there any conversation, don't, please, whatever? No, sir. With any of this? I don't remember hearing any of that. I, I will tell you that once I engaged, I was engaged. Okay. Um, so it's like, at that point, it's almost like a video game. It's not a game, but it's almost like you, you're, you're focused on, you've been there, sir. You know what I'm talking about. Absolutely insane. I can't imagine what must have been going through the detectives' heads at this point. Todd says he then walked around and put one last round in each victim's forehead, got in his car, and drove home. He took the gun apart, put its no, parts into parts that's... of his trash and even cat litter, and then disposed of that evidence in the dumpster. The man had been so long that you guys could have actually pulled records and actually not figure out where they put it, but at this point, it's kind of a new point. When the detectives go on to clarify some points, Todd just finds every opportunity to make it about himself. Moving targets, multiple moving targets. No, I don't think I missed. If I did, it wasn't more than once. Okay. Um, but I mean, it, it's not an easy shot when you got two moving targets running fast as they can. Say, stop! Just stop! I, I just, I just stop. It. Is one thing. Right. But I'm not a pistol whipping and beating somebody is not my thing. He even makes a point to say he wasn't initially planning on shooting the mom. Like that gives him some sort of brownie points or something. I actually wasn't meaning to hit the mom. You actually what? I was not meaning to hit the mom. Ted, no power, I'm why? I'm shoot women if I can. Okay. I'm gonna refuse to shoot a kid. But then Todd's dark sense of humor comes through every now and then to remind us how he really feels about oh, his actions. Oh, this. I still got a t-shirt. They give you a t-shirt? They did. Now that's gonna power back the pumps all the way out. Which will you know, repower the bottom, down. and ah, uh, that's so you cringe, dude. No, sir, that was actually. I got you. Um, I don't keep drugs. But at this point, nothing is too shocking coming from the man famous for saying, "My golf game was weak. My kill game is strong." What might be most frustrating about the Superbike case in the end is that during the 13-year-long investigation, one asset that police gained was a sketch of a potential suspect that a witness, presumably a customer who had been one of the last people at the bike shop that day, had described. The witness remembered this man filling out paperwork no power. to buy a particular bike. In 2012, the sheriff held up a newly revised well, sketch and said, I'm going to be bold enough to say this is my man right here. This is that picture. As accurate as it may be, it unfortunately wasn't able to catch Todd before he committed his other atrocities. Now, to be honest, the raw footage of Todd's whole confession was tedious to watch at times. You see, Todd didn't want to write out his statement because he said he writes for a living and his hands hurt. And so the detectives had to stop him after every sentence and very slowly transcribe his confession. At one point, even saying Todd uses big words and talks fast. Here's where things get super intriguing, though. Many people argue that this was actually a deliberate interrogation tactic, and when you think about it, it makes sense. 
By playing dumb and making Todd feel like he's smarter than them, they subtly encourage him to keep talking freely and bragging about his accomplishments, yeah, no shit, uh... not to mention repeating key details over and over again. And on the same token, while some people have questioned why detectives even needed to write down his answers in the first place, since the interview was being taped, others assert that suspects often don't realize they are being recorded, and having someone write down their words in front of them would make them feel even more secure that this conversation is not being permanently taped therefore making them feel comfortable sharing more risky details or side comments that they might not otherwise divulge. Okay, now this next part has nothing to do with crime, but it is super interesting to me because it feels like Todd is really basking in the feeling of being catered to while trying to seem humble and friendly with the detectives at the same time. I don't know, the whole thing just gives me a weird vibe because of how I casual, like gens, unbothered, and almost giddy he's power? acting while confessing murders. What are you for dinner? You missed dinner over there. That barbecue wasn't enough. Well, what do you want? Well, what do you have for me? No, I'm asking you. What oh. do you want? <laughs> uh, I won't be an asshole. Um, shut that door, Mark. You're not being an asshole. I'm, I'm telling. I'm asking you. What, what do you want for dinner? Uh, I don't know. We've. Uh, We've got, what do you got? Like around that. here. We've got Miami Grill around here. We've got we've, we've got the whatever you want, man. Boiling Springs cookout, whatever. What's your what do you like to eat? Cookout will work. I just that'll work. What do you like from cookout? Never been there. Yes, ne sir. They have a really good. It's called a giant cheeseburger, um, giant fries, and a giant tea. They're really good. What's for me? That's what I usually get. Okay. Right, I'll be right back. I, I just a giant. What? Giant everything, dude. I'm feeding you. Thank you. So I mean, okay. There are actually a lot of moments sprinkled throughout where Todd seems just a bit too comfortable, given the subject matter at hand. So he's gonna win Trump or uh, Hillary? I'm scared. No. I think she's really in the way. But to be honest, there were times during the confession when I did feel like I was watching buddies talk, and it was a little surreal. Is that good? Mm -hmm. I want to steer you off. I want to steer you wrong, man. Boom, boom, my face. I made a joke with him. I was like, yeah, I'm going to go back to the pod. I'm going to let one part loose, and I might get pretty jealous. <laughs> Take this crop dust. <laughs> So, y'all have sandwiches again. <laughs> 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 They're actually like a well, midget. Well, the, the, more the, more the more trouble he is, the more he talks. The more he talks, the more he that serves the public, and, which means uh, he goes to prison. And this is when I first realized it. And I, we didn't expect it from my generation. But if being friendly with Todd was enough to butter him up to spill the whole truth and put him behind bars for life, it was worth it. In the end, I think this statement from the investigator best sums up how authorities were able to treat Todd with kindness and respect, despite the things he's done. The thing about it is, like you said, there are cops in the world that are bad, there are cops in the world that are good. I should not like you. Mm -hmm. I should want to nail you to the cross. Mm -hmm. You know, but I'm going there anyway. Well, no, let's not that. But yeah, I, I get it. I, I want to do the right thing for you. I want to make sure the right thing is done for you and right. by you. Right. I don't do this job just to put people in jail and do stuff like that. I do this job because that's the way I want to be. This next part of the conversation might give us the most valuable insight into Todd's Chat, headspace. Chat, I don't make any items. So I'll let it play without commentary. I wonder how this is going to play out. Well, then. They're either going to put me on a gurn, oh. mm -hmm. which is what I'm expecting. That's what I'm expecting. Or <clears throat> they're going to put me in a little box somewhere, Pice, away from anybody and everybody, plates. which I don't expect. I actually expect to earn. What do you want? Pipes and reinforcement plates. Reinforcement plates. plates. I mean, I'm joking aside, I'll tell what do you want? Take me out back, shoot me back in the head? No, I wouldn't. I studied psychology a little bit in college. Mm -hmm. Want me to finish? Like I said, I was trying to, I'm working on finishing college. <clears throat> the people at Superbikes made you angry. Mm -hmm. I don't know. You tell me. Well, the people at Superbikes made you angry, and 
and, and not just angry, but I mean, they belittled you, they humiliated you, they made you angry mm -hmm. enough to, to do what happened. Mm -hmm. And then you had the situation last, this last Christmas and then this most recent situation. Mm -hmm. The time span, mm -hmm. what kept the thing from happening? You know, because that, that's a question. <clears throat> I don't need to kill. Well, I'm not saying you do. I mean, you know, you know but that's a, that's a genuine question. I mean, per your legal definition, mm -hmm. I'm serial, but I'm not. Okay. okay. Honestly, if Johnny hadn't pulled the knife, mm -hmm. if you would seen the knife, you'd laugh your ass off. Really? Oh, God. What, black and white tiger stripe. It was one of those. The handle? Yeah. One time you buy it at the little convenience store? Are you serious? <laughs> I'm going, my ammo costs more than your, than your damn knife. Are you kidding me? <coughs> <laughs> you're costing me money. But you're going to stab me, at least stab me with a butt knife or something. You know? <laughs> <laughs> something with some, something wrong with a little history. You know? I'll get the thing up on the dinner. Are you fucking with me? I'm dipping after you, Johnny. Oh, yeah. <laughs> He put that thing out, and I went, there's how it's going to go. Okay. Let's dance. <clears throat> and the other problem is if they don't put me on the gurney, mm -hmm. when the people inside realize the people I hunt is them, <clears throat> they'll, they'll be scared to death of you. And then... And then assembler again with pipes like with super for and frames. It's just a reactional situation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't have ever heard of a person again. And for me to take myself, it's not hard. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can slam the throat on a on a desk somewhere and crush the air dust. You know, and die of shitty death. Yeah, but you can do it. But you hurt the people. If I did any of that, and I won't, mm -hmm. it would probably cause my mother to have a heart attack and die. Yeah. As Todd was sealing his fate, investigators were conducting a thorough search of his property. They found a multitude of weapons and ammunition, such as handguns with silencers and rifles. But as there was no record of a background check under Todd's name for firearm purchases, it is believed that he illegally obtained these, which just adds to the laundry list of his crimes. In 2017, Todd Kolhab pleaded guilty to seven counts of murder, two counts of kidnapping, and one count of criminal sexual assault. He entered a plea bargain that spared him from capital punishment and instead was sentenced to seven consecutive life sentences without the possibility of parole, plus 60 years. Relatives of the Superbike shooting victims filed a wrongful death lawsuit against him, and Kayla has also filed her own civil lawsuit against Todd. She was awarded $6.3 million. Oh, damn. However, even behind bars, Todd has not been silent. In late 2017, he wrote to the Spartanburg Herald Journal, claiming that he had more victims who have yet to be discovered, which would go along with what he told his mother right after he was caught. When she asked how many other victims there were besides the ones he confessed to, he apparently said, you do not have enough fingers. In the eight-page letter to the publication, Todd wrote, Yes, there is more than seven. I tried to tell investigators, and I did tell the FBI, but it was blown off. It's not an addition problem, it's a multiplication problem. Yeah, leaves the state so, and leaves the country. So cool, Thank you, man. private pilot's Holy license. Shit, yes, Todd apparently earned his pilot's license at some point and could have potentially traveled to commit more unsolved murders. But he has also expressed that at this point, he doesn't see any oh, reason to give sense. numbers or locations of other victims. At the same time, though, Todd reassured investigators in 2016 that he hadn't, in fact, killed anyone else. Have you killed anybody else in Spartanburg? No, sir. Have you killed anybody else in South Carolina? No, sir. Other than the boy in Arizona and Superbikes mm -hmm. and the ones that we have on the property, mm -hmm. have you killed anybody else? And this is where I ask you this. Is that enough? I do, but no, 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 this is the thing. No, this is the thing. This is not to drive a nail home or anything like that, okay? You had your moment in here with your mom, and I, I, this is your opportunity to get everything. It, it's not, you, you know what I'm saying? It's an opportunity to get everything out of the way. Nine. 
you know, because you're going to be sitting in a cell, mm -hmm. and, and there's going to be lonely times, and right. and you're a compassionate person. I'm a right. compassionate person. Mm -hmm. Okay, in the heat of the moment, when somebody pisses you off, the logistics of this are dark garbage. Out of them, shoot them, stab them, kill them, whatever. Mm -hmm. <sighs> but when you're laying there at night, it's going it may bother you. You, you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And that's the only reason I'm asking. That's all. That's the only one you shot. Okay. Um, I didn't want to have to explain numbers on the phone. I sure didn't want to get numbers of four. So when you told mom she didn't have enough I fingers, I just didn't know what to tell her on the phone. Okay, so that was kind of not an audible saying but it was just something to. <coughs> didn't want to give her phone numbers. I gotcha. I gotcha. Okay. More, hand, more than one hand, but um, it's not really a bragging kind of. I understand. Some of these knuckleheads may call that, ooh, that's cool. I, I don't really call that cool. Hey, Todd, a while ago you made a statement that said, that when you, you just said, those are the only people I've shot. Mm -hmm. Any other means? Mm -hmm. Okay. What do you think? On one hand, it does seem a little suspicious that there would be a 13-year lull in between the superbike shooting and Todd's next victims. But I can also see how Todd might just be showboating in a bid to get more attention now that his case is died pipes, down. Son, is but get this. Some people actually think that Todd may not have even really committed the superbike murders. All right, strap in, because now I'm going to take you through some of the more controversial internet theories and conspiracies that have arisen around this case. Just a disclaimer, I'm not endorsing these theories in any way, but I think it's really fascinating to see the information people have dug up and the wildly different conclusions they've come to. So, about the superbike murders. A woman named Pat Brown, who is a profiler claiming to have worked on this case in the past, has written about her doubts. She says a serial killer that is also a mass murderer is not what you would normally expect because serial killers like to have complete control over their victims. She also feels that there is no actual evidence beyond a potentially false confession that Todd was the perpetrator in this case. And she even asserted that the sheriff was up for re-election around the time Todd confessed. And this may have been a convenient way to solve that cold case in the nick of time. However, a counterpoint to this idea is that Todd mentioned a detail in his confession that apparently was never released to the public before, when he said that he shot each of the victims in the forehead, so investigators feel pretty confident that he was the one behind the crime. But still, Pat refutes this claim and actually says that none of the victims were shot in the forehead. There's, honestly, so much to go into here, but to me, it seems like Todd's motive and explanation of this crime were clear, so I'll let you decide what you think really happened. And then another conspiracy theory people have posited centers around Kayla herself. This one is rather sensitive, and I again want to emphasize that I don't subscribe to these beliefs and would never do anything to blame the victim, as I what she had to go through was Felix. undoubtedly don't unimaginable. With well, that being said, here is the theory some Please. people propose. Also, when Kayla yes, appeared on Dr. Up. Phil to talk about wake the case, up. she said that she met Todd on Facebook several years before, and they had had little contact besides a few messages here and there where he would ask how she's doing before he ultimately contacted her about the job opportunity. However, according to the Newberry Observer, an initial interview at Todd's residence between Todd and an investigator suggested that there may have been more to the relationship. The alleged transcript of that exchange shows the investigator asking Todd if Kayla was a stripper who would also sleep with Todd for money, which Todd claims is true. He also apparently claimed that he'd taken her to dinner and that she'd spent the night at his house before, among other physical encounters. Oh so these details have apparently uh, led some that that bitch. circles to speculate that Kayla could have known more than she was letting on about the whole situation, especially considering those letters she had allegedly written to Todd during her capture. Other updates that have added fuel to this fire include the fact that Kayla in 2019 was charged with third-degree criminal domestic violence after a fight between her and her boyfriend. Kayla claimed that during an argument, the man bucked his chest into her. Then she struck him in the face with a closed fist, and then he allegedly slammed her to the ground and put her in a headlock. The charge was her first criminal charge in South Carolina and was eventually dismissed. However, people still drew attention to another tragedy that occurred in her life about five months okay, before Okay, guys, I wasn't incident. listening at the same time. At that time, her then fiance shockingly died of a self-inflicted stab wound to the chest. All of these factors have caused some internet communities to turn a suspicious eye on Kayla, but at the same time, most recognize that she is still trying to heal from the traumatic experience she endured at the hands of Todd Kolhep. I think everyone can agree that even if we don't have the full picture of Kayla's life, she was still a victim who did not deserve any of the horrible things that happened to her during that kidnapping. 
Yeah, and but I people are so fucking well brain today, dead, though they don't really Or at care. least getting the help she needs to work back towards a normal life. Further updates following Todd's arrest have failed to show any growth nor regret Rotors on his part. In a hearing, family members of the superbike victims got to make statements directly to Todd. And after uh. one mother spoke about how Todd was frustrated that he couldn't ride a bike properly and said her son would have been happy to show him how, Todd actually spoke up to say, With all due respect, ma'am, I'm sorry, but your information is incorrect. The judge reminded him he was only allowed to speak if he had a question for the mother. Todd apparently remarked, I want to let her know why it happened. Jeez, I bet you could have heard a pin drop in that room. Todd is certainly one of the most psychologically intriguing killers I've ever heard of. According to a forensic psychologist who was interviewed about 130 serial killers, Todd wanted to believe he was a good guy. He apparently doesn't want to be associated with the worst serial killers and has said, I'm not a bad person, but I do bad things sometimes. It seems he justifies his murders in his head by classifying people into categories of good or bad. But obviously, it's a childish mindset to have when you think you can judge people's character and decide their life or death based on how it suits you. Perhaps his twisted personal philosophy and complete lack of remorse was best summed up when he told detectives, I've never done anything to anybody who didn't have it coming. We need more nodes. Todd uh, Cole's story is especially disturbing, I think, because in the eyes of most people who knew him, he was just a normal dude. Outgoing and charismatic even, and at the very least, successful. 50 meters. He's a guy you probably wouldn't give a second look if you passed him on the street, and you'd probably walk Wait. away from a conversation with him thinking he's a chatty, decent guy. And maybe that's the most scary part of all, is wondering how many monsters like Todd are hidden in plain sight. That was a fucking disaster. When I found out what happened, I... The fuck? Just love it. It was good, though.